Good morning and welcome to the forum. On today's programme, we are looking at the world of Sir Edward Watkins. My special guest in the studio is Jeff Scargill. He's the chair of the Friends of Rose Hill and an expert on Sir Edward Watkin and Rose Hill, the house in Northenden where he lived. Uh, good, good morning, Jeff. Good morning, man. Um, tell us, um, first of all, a bit about yourself. You, you, you grew up in Northenden, didn't you? Yes, I grew up in Northern and after the war, and uh, I lived actually in Northern um, and uh, when my mother remarried, uh, went to live in Northern Moor, and then uh, when I became a teacher, I went to work at uh, what was Poundswick, now the brilliant Manchester Academy, a couple of hundred yards away from the uh, the Forum in Withenshaw. So uh, my roots go deep into Northern I was married there, our son was... Uh, baptised in Northern Methodist Church, which is where I spent most of my youth. And now you've retired, you do lots of talks, don't you? I do all my talks to raise money for cancer research. Uh, it's a family connection because uh, a brilliant surgeon, Noel Clark at uh, Christie, the, the Christie as it's now called, really basically saved the life of our son. And uh, so I thought, well, since I'm used to getting on my hind legs in front of difficult or easy classes, I'll, I'll do talks and raise money for cancer research, for him in particular, the, the surgeon. And your most popular talk is about Sir Edward Watkin, isn't it? Yes, I'm amazed, really, but I'm, I'm delighted because obviously I have a, a passionate interest in Edward Watkin, but uh, I don't advertise any of my talks, so uh, secretaries of organisations pass the word round. I must have given a talk on Edward Watkin, I must have given about 20-odd oh, in the last few months, simply by people telling other people that it's uh, an amazing story that people ought to know, and of course I'm glad to say yes. And um, he's not that, even for people from round here, may not have heard of him. No. Uh, but he's, uh, was, he, basically he was a Victorian railway engineer, wasn't he? Yes, in fact, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Probably the most surprising thing about Edward Watkin is nobody's heard of him. Uh, I usually start my talk off by saying, has anybody heard of Edward Watkin? And if anybody's a real railway enthusiast, they will know that he built the Great Central Railway, which was the last main line into London before High Speed 1, and it went from Central Station, GMEX, near, near the Midland Hotel in Manchester, through to a new station which he built called Marylebone Station in London. And so people who are interested in railway history have heard of Edward Watkin, but actually, as you've just touched on, he did some amazing things, and I don't think of him as a railway man. No. Well, we'll hear about his other other amazing things in a in a bit. Um, but there's been a project uh, with a, with a uh, Manchester Academy um, school uh, about the world of Watkin, hasn't there? That's just that's just concluded. Yes, Manchester Academy, also Newell Green High School, uh, have been involved. Um, this has uh, been a project since last April, and the young people set to with the aid of money from the National Heritage Lottery Fund um, and a terrific team of staff. Uh, they set to simply to investigate the world of Watkin, as you've already called it. Uh, wow for short. And it is quite wow as well. You can see on YouTube, if you search for the world of Watkin, there are some, some good videos there. And there's a really nice animation, which unfortunately you won't be able to see as this is radio, <laughs> but there's a brilliant poem that goes with it, which we're going to hear. Uh, we're going to hear that now. We want to take you back 200 years to northern Lancashire. Cars didn't exist, the railways ruled rich were their passengers. Sir Edward Watkin was the man, we'll tell you all about his grand plan. He was a railway king, but that's not the start. He fought for what he had in his heart. First he joined the Anti-Corn Law League to help families suffering from fatigue. They worked to lower the price of bread so people did not end up dead. Next he campaigned for public parks to improve Manchester's review from Karl Marx. Phillips, Queens and Peel Park resulted. Lack of funding from government left Watkin insulted. His most tremendous successes were linked to trains. At nine railway companies, he held the reins. He united Canada by railway and is known as a railway king to this day. 
He dreamt of building a line from Britain to France. Queen Victoria and Parliament got rid of that chance. Because of fear of French invasion, Watkin never rose to that occasion. Finally, it's off to the site of Wembley, an impressive tower of iron assembly. Unfortunately, the tower was never completed. Running out of money left Watkin defeated. There we are. So that just about um, sums it all up, I think, doesn't it? We can we can go home now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, that that that's lovely. That's done. The poem was written, I think, by uh, one of the staff of the Wow Project, Lisa, but uh, KT and uh, Ellie. Uh, uh, with the lovely voices there and, and that just really sums it up as you say we could go home now but we could perhaps fill in some detail yes um, so wh- where do we begin really we've, we've touched on him being a, a, ra- a railway in- engineer um, and c- continuing on that vein I suppose he he started to build the original channel tunnel didn't he yeah, that's quite amazing. He um, became chairman of uh, railway companies going from the north of England to the south coast. Uh, the uh, the Great Central Railway uh, came out of two of those, but he was also chairman of the Southern Railway that went down to Dover. And his idea was to have a railway line from Manchester to Paris. And all he needed to do was dig 22 miles under the English Channel. It was a fantastic project. We're talking about 1880. And he was given permission by the government to start it. And he actually got two miles under the Channel from from Dover. Uh, The French started one mile from Calais. So there were three miles of the 22 were built. And then the government panicked. They came to the conclusion that the French would invade through this hole in the ground which must look balmy now uh, to to think about them you know thousands of french soldiers coming out of a hole in the ground without anybody doing anything about it so they stopped him the uh, it's worth thinking about what it would have been like if he'd succeeded because when the present channel tunnel was built in the 1990s they broke through at one point into Watkins 1880 tunnel and it was dry so he had the technology he had a brilliant new drilling machine uh, and uh, although he had the technology he didn't have the political power and I'm afraid we uh, we withdrew from the project for another hundred years but interestingly just a little footnote to that then his plan which he didn't publicize very much was actually to have a railway line through to India, which sounds balmy, but of course there were no planes in those days. Trains were the fastest and safest way to travel. And it's interesting, I don't know whether you heard a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese just established a railway link from China to London. So he was ahead of his time. Mm. And the technology to build, um, as you said, he had new drilling machines and, and things, mm. but it, it must have be- meant a lot more labour-intensive than, than when they built the Channel Tunnel in the 90s. Yes, indeed. Uh, it, it, the main workers were, were miners. There was one Welsh miner who uh, carved his name on the, uh, the wall of the tunnel. This tunnel was begun in 1880. He obviously didn't write very well. He, he couldn't spell the word begun, and it's uh, got quite a few alterations in it, uh, with his name William Sharp. But unfortunately the tunnel is now sealed up and uh, nobody can read that, that sign. But it's, it certainly yeah. was labour intensive. It's a shame it's not open to the public and we can all go Indeed. down there. Uh, did any, did any uh, workers die in the, in the process of doing no. those too much? No one died. I haven't heard of any that no. died, no. unlike the Settle and Carlisle Railway, which yeah lost hundreds of workers and the french coming the other side were they using the same technology as was, yes. it, the, was it the same project yeah. or was it their well it was the same project in so much as they were working together they knew of each other because otherwise <laughs> they might have gone past <laughs> each other under the english channel which would have been a bit, a bit embarrassing so there was coordination but the french started by uh, creating their tunnel with explosives but they soon heard about edward watkins new brilliant uh, air-conditioned drilling machine, which which meant there was pure air down there, as well as driving the actual uh, drilling machine, and they they bought one as well. So there was coordination. It's the forum with Ben, and this week we're talking about that um, Victorian railway engineer plus 
uh, Edward Watkin, and my guest in the studio is Jeff Scargill. And uh, we were just talking before that about um, uh, one of his uh, 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 unfinished projects, the Channel Tunnel. And another big flop was the Watkin Tower. He wanted to build uh, uh, an equivalent to the Eiffel Tower, didn't he, Jeff? Yes, the Eiffel Tower was the sensation. We're talking about the 1890s now, the sensation of Paris, of course. And uh, he was always a great showman, Edward Watkin. He always thought big. So uh, he decided to build a, an Eiffel Tower, we can call it for short, because it actually there was a competition with uh, m- many, many entries, but the, the winner looked very like the Eiffel Tower. Uh, he wasn't bothered what it looked like, as long as it was bigger than the tower in France. He was that sort of man. And uh, it was going to be 1,200 feet high, which would have been the biggest man-made building in the history of the world. It was going to be the centrepiece of a park, uh, an amusement park with cricket grounds, football grounds, trees, lake, um, uh, bandstand and so on for the people of London to come out to a rural part of London that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, it was called Wembley. And uh, he started the tower, got uh, 400 feet up. The park was very, very successful. The money ran out for the tower. So, sadly, it just stood on the skyline of London for another 20 years, rusting until it was pulled down. The interesting thing is that uh, the park was taken over for the Wembley exhibition in 1923, became Wembley Stadium for football and great great sporting occasions. And when the uh, old Wembley Stadium was virtually falling apart about 20 years ago, I think, and they built the new Wembley Stadium, they had to dig down because the present pitch is lower than the old pitch. And underneath the uh, uh, the present pitch of Wembley Stadium are the uh, four legs, the four foundations of Watkins Tower. And uh, a little footnote, uh, he had a railway line. He wanted people to come by railway, of course, because he, he, he owned the railway line. And he built a special station uh, for people to go to his park. And he called it Wembley Park. If you look at an underground map, you'll see Wembley Park still exists. It's where you get off. But I don't suppose anybody thinks, Park? Where does that come from? Yeah, well, I've been there quite a few times to see things at Wembley Stadium. And I've, I have, a, in the back of my mind, as you go through, you think, well, why, why is it called Wembley Park? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now I know. Yeah. There you go. And, and talking of parks, um, that was one of his flops, really, the, the Watkin Tower. But he had many successes, didn't yes. he? Including um, parks for Manchester. Yes, I think this is incredible that Manchester has never honoured him or remembered him. He's completely forgotten in this area as as well as throughout the country and internationally. Although, by the way, when he died, there were 150 obituaries throughout the whole world about him. But getting back to the Manchester parks, Manchester was the greatest industrial city in the world, tremendously wealthy, but also really the working conditions, as we know, for the the ordinary people were absolutely dire. There were almost no trees and plants and flowers that they could enjoy. And other great cities like Sheffield, Birmingham, London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, they all had parks, but Manchester extraordinarily had no parks. So he set about with some friends raising money and he raised the equivalent of two million pounds. He was only in his early 20s by addressing meetings, knocking on the doors of rich people and uh, having a subscription for ordinary people as well. And he collected the money, bought three plots of land from wealthy landowners, two in Manchester, one in Salford, and handed them over to the council. He did the lot, handed them over to the two councils, and they are now Queen's Park, Phillips Park, and Peel Park in Salford. And they're a lasting memorial to Watkin, but there's no plaque to say so. He, he became an MP, didn't he? He sort of followed in his um, father's footsteps. Uh, mm. When he was a young man, he uh, campaigned um, against the Corn Laws. Uh, yes. what, what, we've, heard, we've probably all heard of the Corn Laws, but remind us... <laughs> remind us, what were the Corn Laws? The Corn Laws were designed to keep up the price of corn. It's part of the staple diet of bread, of course. But the price of corn in the first part of the 19th century, uh, foreign imports would have been cheaper. 
uh, but um, uh, there was a tax put on foreign imports uh, to bring them up to the price of the corn produced in this country, which meant that the price uh, that the corn in this country could be sold, but it also meant it was at a very, very high price. And in many years, particularly when there was a bad harvest, people literally starved to death in Britain. So there was a spontaneous movement started up led by a great statesman called Richard Cobden, who was MP for Stockport, um, and John Bright, his great companion. And it was called the Anti-Corn Law League, and it agitated to change these laws to bring down the price of bread. And actually, it succeeded. It was a great popular movement. It, it succeeded in bringing down the price of bread and actually brought down the government as well at the same time. Absalom... Edward's father was very prominent in that. He lived at Rose Hill, which will be coming on to the house in Northern. And uh, Richard Cobden asked Edward if he would uh, set up a sort of um, side branch of the anti corn Law League, particularly to work with the, uh, the, the ordinary working class in, in the factories and so on. And he did that. He organised it very successfully. As I say, he was only in his 20s. And uh, that led him to become recognised and in fact as you just said he became an MP but he was following, he had a good pedigree he was following in the footsteps of Absalom who was actually involved in the Peterloo massacres of 1819 which were coming up for their 200th anniversary which were roughly where uh, the Midland Hotel uh, Free Trade Hall older listeners will remember in Manchester where there was a great gathering of people in 1819 to protest about uh, well to try and get voting reform because basically uh, only a small number of people had the vote in this country uh, no women uh, but only a small number of men and the um, the local authorities authorities panicked because I think there was a crowd of something like 80,000 all in the Sunday best it was a lovely day all peaceful and uh, the authorities sent the soldiers in with drawn swords and there were 17 people killed many hundred injured and they became known as the Peterloo massacre because it was shortly after the battle of Waterloo and it was one of the turning points of uh, democracy in this country mm. well Absalom Watkin together with another friend drew up a petition of protest. So Absalom was very much involved in that and hope that will be remembered in a couple of years' time, 1819 to 2019. Uh, that was Absalom Wilkin, that was his father, and they both lived at Rose Hill, the big house mm. we're going to be talking about in a minute that's um, still, it's still there, isn't it, up there in North London, but it's now been converted into flats. Yes. The Forum with Ben on WFM. In the studio this week is Jeff Scargill. He's the chair of the Friends of Rose Hill. And Rose Hill is where Sir Edward Watkin lived. What, what sort of man was Edward Watkin, Jeff? Well, he's what I think a lot of people nowadays would call an alpha male. He liked to win. He liked to be top dog. I don't think he was a team player. He was very, very brilliant, very, very quick. They called him Nimble Ned. Uh, amongst other names, which were perhaps less complimentary from uh, people who didn't like him. But a uh, lovely little story to show his character. Um, St. Wilfrid's Church is the local church, of course, in Northern and the parish church. And in the 1870s, common with lo lots of other areas in those wealthy Victorian times, it was decided to rebuild St. Wilfrid's Church. And it was paid for by public subscription. And uh, uh, Edward Watkin gave £500, which is about £50,000 in modern money. And he was top of the list, which is where he liked to be. And then along came uh, one of the Tattons, who owned Withenshaw Hall and Withenshaw Park, the local squire. And he gave £850. Well, Edward wasn't best pleased with this. So he arranged for his wife to give a further donation of £350, which brought him up to 850 But the real, typical Edward Watkin part of the story is it wasn't £350, it was £350 and ninepence, 
which I think made the point a little bit too strongly. I'll bet he was never invited to tea at Withenshaw Hall after that afternoon tea. He had to be top dog. And when his father died, he moved into Rose Hill. Yes. And we went along, didn't we, last week, Jeff, for a bit of a recce before doing this programme. Yes. Up, up to the the house and in the woods there. And the, there is a stone in the, in the woods, isn't it, that was part of the, the house. T- tell us about the stone in the woods. Yes, this is uh, really a sad story, I suppose, really, but one that I think is going to have a good ending. When uh, Absalom died in 1861, um, actually Edward and his wife had already moved in because Absalom had had a series of strokes and they moved into the house to care for him. But when Absalom died, obviously Edward inherited the house. And in 1862, he erected a memorial to his father, um, a rectangular stone about five feet high, and it was on the terrace of the house. Now, the house Rose Hill, which is a grade two starred listed building, which puts it in one of the top five, it's one of the top 5% of historic houses in England. Uh, that's because but during Edward's time, Prime Ministers visited it, Gladstone Disraeli stayed there, Charles Dickens stayed there, all sorts of great people stayed there. And they would go out on the terrace after they'd had a a meal and they would see this stone, it was on the terrace and it was to remember his father, Absalom Watkin. Sadly, over the years, the stone has been absorbed into the wood. It's no longer part of the terrace. It's not been moved, but it's just been lost in the wood, overgrown, covered in vegetation. Nobody can see it. It's at the top of the slope. When I discovered it, I broke a rib climbing up to it. You remember, you and I walked very carefully it was, up that yes, slope. It was quite tricky. Yeah, <laughs> quite tricky. Well, the Friends of Rose Hill want to move that stone to a more accessible part of the wood, uh, clean it up so that you can read the lettering on, which is about absolute Watkins' life, and it'll be a sort of centrepiece of the wood. So it's a sad story because it, the stone has been forgotten, uh, but it'll have a happy ending, and actually it'll be a memorial to both Absalom Watkin and Edward Watkin, and it is the only memorial in Manchester to them, except one in the uh, church put up by the family in St Wilfrid's Church. So it's an important part of what we're trying to do with the Friends of Rose Hill. And another significant find in the house was the iceberg painting, yes. wasn't it? T- tell us uh, about the iceberg painting. This, this really is a wow. Um, this, this painting was bought by Edward Watkin in 1863. It was painted by uh, an American painter who's unknown in this country called Frederick Church. He couldn't sell it in America because it was the time of the Civil War and nobody was spending any money. So he shipped it to London and sold it and it was bought anonymously and it disappeared. And in 1979 it was rediscovered by a lady called Maya Balsh who worked at Rose Hill which was actually a remand home. She discovered this painting, wrote to an art gallery in America and asked if they'd be interested. To cut a long story short, it turned out to be a lost masterpiece and it was sold at Sotheby's in New York for the equivalent of four million pounds. And it's now in the Dallas Museum in Texas and they call it their Mona Lisa. And we're going to hear a clip now from some of the work the uh, the school kids did. They interviewed Maya Bolsh, isn't it? They interviewed her, and let's hear a little bit of that interview now. So, as a part of their projects, they went to an interview with a very special lady, Maya. It was Maya who discovered the icebergs still hanging, and more than a hundred years at the top of the stairs in Rose Hill. This is what she told them. Well, I didn't find it. It was very much in situ when we moved into Rose Hill, and you, you couldn't miss it <laughs> because it was on the landing outside our uh, the area we lived in. 
and then it goes it goes on and on it's well worth if you want to hear more of that uh, do check out the youtube channel world of watkin uh, there's lots of uh, videos and interesting stuff uh, that the kids have have done and and we've done some amazing stuff those kids haven't they yeah. but they were amazing and of course in addition to finding out about edward watkin they found out how to interview mm. self-confidence mm. i mean last week f- four of them spoke in front of an audience of a hundred including the lord mayor and they're only uh, 13 14 years old mm. so they 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 gained a lot in confidence mm. now tell us about coming on from the iceberg painting tell us about your aunt edith <laughs> yeah uh, my aunt edith uh, worked at Rose Hill in the 1950s and um, this, this painting was hanging at the top of the stairs and she said to her boss one day that's a nice painting and he said do you want it? and she said well how could I f- fit a painting 10 feet by 5 feet in a council house imagine what she thought when she read in the Manchester New- News it had been sold in New York for two and a half million dollars four million pounds oh, wow. great story and he's a, he's a great painter he's not that well known over here no is he? No, he's, he's virtually unknown. He has had an exhibition at the Tate Gallery uh, a, a few years ago, and actually Maya went, was invited, uh, which must, I know it was a great thrill for her uh, to go down and see, because the icebergs was included in that exhibition. But in Canada and America, the icebergs is a painting of the, the icebergs in, uh, in, in the Arctic part of Canada. Uh, in America and Canada, he is revered, he is the American painter, and that is a masterpiece. And they are amazing paintings. If you look at these videos here, you'll see some of his other paintings as well. Yeah. And I imagine, the, the, uh, I'd love to see it in actual, be in the room and see it. Uh, it's, it's so very, would I. It, it must look absolutely fantastic. Yeah, one of the videos shows the curator being interviewed uh, of the Dallas Museum, and uh, she's in front of the painting, and it looks pretty good. Better than it did hanging on a dusty landing in Northern London. It's the Forum, and um, we're talking to Jeff Scargill about uh, the Friends of Rose Hill. You are the chairman, aren't you, of the Friends of Rose Hill, Jeff? Yeah, we've got two aims. One is to uh, try and get the amazing Watkin family, Absalom and principally Edward, better known, but also to publicise this beautiful little wood just off Longley Lane in Northenden, which is open to the public, and uh, particularly in the spring that's coming up, it's wonderful being in there and uh, we're trying to get it revived uh, better paths put down as I said before we're trying to move the stone to be a centre point and next to the stone our plan is to have a, uh, a metal information plaque drawing attention to uh, uh, the Watkin family and the woods and the, the great history and we're also working uh, very closely with the rector of St Wilfrid's Church, the parish church Edward Watkin dedicated six stained glass windows there and Edward and his father and Edward's wife are buried in the churchyard there so we're going to publish later on in this year if we get the money from the Heritage Lottery Fund we're going to publish a Watkin Walk which will start at St Wilfrid's Church and wind its way through to uh, Rose Hill and pick up all the interesting bits along the way and of course the history of the Watkins so that's what the uh, the friends there just local people uh, volunteers uh, uh, are all about and um, as well as well as that Watkin Walk of course there's the Watkin Path isn't there in, in Snowdon I, I used to live um, I used to work at a youth hostel at the bottom of Snowdon and we used to go up the Watkin Path quite a bit there's Gladstone Rock there mm. and that's I didn't realise I didn't know who Watkin was or mm. why it was called no. the Watkin Path but no. that was named after Edward Watkin how did he get that named after him? Well he had a villa just near uh, uh, actually on Snowdon and he had this idea of dedicating a path to the public uh, up to the top of Snowdon and um, he got his good friend Gladstone who stayed quite often at Rose Hill the Prime Minister uh, to open it and that's why you just referred to the Gladstone Rock Mm. and there's a plaque there which says that it was dedicated actually by Sir Edward Watkin it was the first public footpath in Britain and he had the idea and he paid for it 
Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for coming in. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with you, they can get email you, can't they? Yes, be glad to answer any questions or anybody got any ideas or any information. Uh, lowercase g scargill g s c a r g i w l at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from anybody. It's a great story.